Hello, welcome to our talk on ML Ops um, for ground operations of the ISS. We are really excited to be here, especially excited that so many of you made it to this talk at such a late hour um, and partying yet down in the exhibition hall. Before we start talking about ML Ops, we'll give you a brief introduction about ourselves and how we got here. I'll start. So my title nowadays is data scientist, but I haven't done any data scientisting in quite some time. Instead, I've been a data engineer, data architect, something like that. So basically building all of what we are going to talk about um, as part of a larger team. I used to be a physicist, um, did a PhD there, got a lot into data analytics there, also like um, running bigger clusters and so on. I've been a data science consultant for some time after this. Um, that's where I picked up wearing jacket like this. Physicists don't look that, like that usually. Um, but I'm a long time Unix nerd, which really helped me out with this because I actually had no previous exposure to uh, Kubernetes at all before. Um, obviously, I knew what it was, but had never really touched it. Um, but without that 20 years of Unix experience, that would have been a much harder journey. Hi, uh, I'm Samo. Uh, similar role as Christian, slightly different background. So my background is in life science. So I have a PhD in computer-aided drug design. So I spent quite some years working in pharma and after that in, in consulting before joining this company. Uh, also have decades of uh, experience with working with open source and, and, and Linux. And before embarking on this project, uh, I had uh, some experience with Kubernetes, but that only from convenience of the cloud. Um, so this talk will be about, we will just give you a high level overview of, of the use case, uh, but we'll then mostly focus on our approach uh, towards designing and building this MLS, uh, MLOps platform and obviously on-prem without the cloud. Uh, we'll talk about major components we used and, and, and how we decided for them. Uh, we'll touch automation, persistent storage, networking, logging and monitoring, and then finally we'll give you some tips and tricks and some useful tools that we discovered during this journey. So what we won't be talking about is any, you know, Kubeflow details, running pipelines, ML jobs, things like that. Uh, we also won't go into any de details about anomaly detection, root cause analysis, and other algorithms we are developing. And also, fortunately, we don't have time to, to uh, go into any details about International Space Station. Um, so the work here is uh, sponsored uh, as part of this project called KISS, and the project is about AI for International Space Station. So what we're getting is, is we're getting telemetry data from International Space Station, and uh, we're trying to develop uh, algorithms for anomaly detection, diagnostics, and finally also reconfiguration. Uh, so if something goes wrong, also the systems can then you know, reconfigure uh, and uh, amend the, the problem. There are four pro project partners, so two German universities, um, then Airbus, and us, just at AI. So the universities are focused on, on the models, uh, while Airbus and, and us, we are mostly focused on, on, the, on the platform itself, and also Airbus uh, provides us with data. And just to give you a rough feeling, so there are like five, six people, not working like full time uh, on, in what, on work on this platform. Um, yeah. So still a, a brief uh, info about uh, International Space Station. So the data we are getting is actually from Columbus module. So this is Europe's first permanent outpost in orbit. Uh, and it's actually a space laboratory. So it weighs 10 tons, takes up to nine tons of, of payload, and it's seven meters long. And you can now here see it also uh, within the International Space, Space Station, which in contrast you know, is 440 tons, uh, weighs 440 tons. So it's a really massive thing. Let's have a closer look. 
So being a laboratory, it has 16 racks for experiments and infrastructure. Uh, but primarily, as mentioned, so we, we are interested in, in, in sensor data, in, in telemetry data. Uh, there are thousands of parameters recorded in one hertz sampling, and this ends up in like 10 gigs of, uh, of data per year. And why is this important, you know, working with this data, having uh, models and, and so on? is because like microgravity really introduces some, some unique challenges. So uh, due to microgravity, you don't have uh, convection. So convection doesn't work. Uh, air is not mixing. And you might get local pockets of, of CO2, which is obviously not good for astronauts. So that's why it's really crucial that ventilation always works. So we have to monitor this. But being this sensitive data, so it's, it's not allowed to go on public cloud. So, so we. Uh, kind of had to develop this platform so it runs on all project partner sites. So this means bare metal clusters, corporate data centers, but we're also still using cloud, but only for, for development. Another requirement was uh, that we can only use uh, open source components and end users are actually data scientists and aerospace engineers and not ne necessarily software engineers. So yeah, we quickly realized that leaving on premises means losing a lot of comfort. So we suddenly had to take care of you know, installing and configuring uh, Kubernetes, taking care of storage, IAM, and all those other things. So, but to, as you do nowadays, we started with, with the workshop and we, we collected some ideas what this platform actually should, should have, uh, what kind of functionality, we, you know, building blocks and, and so on. So we came apparent quite soon that we are going to use Kubernetes, also explains why we're here, because um, it really covers you know, a, a lot or you, you, it's a really flexible platform. Um, then we quickly also decided to go with GitLab for our uh, Git and, and CI CD needs. And then when it comes to data science part, we also fairly quickly uh, zeroed in on Kubeflow. So those are three key pillars for, for us. And then some other components also uh, followed quickly. So just to guide you through those quick pillars, uh, key pillars, so it's GitLab. Uh, why? Because it's, it's open source. It ticks a lot of boxes when it comes to you know, source code, CI, CD, and so on. Then for Kubernetes, so we had to pick a distribution and, and we took a while to evaluate uh, some distributions and then we decided to go with MicroCade. So the, the reasons were because uh, it's like really easy to, to deploy, works with most Linux distributions. It supports single node deployments, but also multi-node deployments. It's still a CNCF certified uh, distribution. And what was also very nice for us, so it, it has a lot of add-ons, which actually get you started really fast, right? So, so we had things up and running quite fast. But still, if you want, which we also did, you can replace those add-ons once you need more flexibility. And then finally, Kubeflow, uh, it's a complete data science workbench. It's Kubernetes native. It's, it's a mature and stable product, and it's also actively developed. So you know, it's an easy pick. So very soon we also realized that uh, we'll have to do some automation. So uh, as it says in Kubernetes uh, values, heroism is not sustainable. And it's especially important for, for small teams that you know, to automate as much as possible. So we have you know, uh, different targets uh, for deployment and, and, and so on. So yeah, and we also had to learn a lot, especially initially. So it really made sense to immediately encode that knowledge into, into code. Um, yeah, so our platform can be completely deployed. Uh, yeah, can be, uh, so the deployment is completely automated. Uh, so we, we are hitting all those different environments. Um, why automation? So it enables quick iterations. So it takes really one hour for complete deployment from, from VMs to things running on top of Kubernetes, including Kubeflow. It's reproducible, it's also scalable, so it's easy to add uh, you know, new nodes, uh, deploy new environments, and so on. Key components for deployment, 
are for us uh, Ansible. So this is our tool of choice when it comes to infrastructure as code. So it's very nice. So you work with YAMLs, it's implemented in Python, supports templating. And what's also important, it's agentless. So you only need SSH uh, access. You don't need any you know, dedicated uh, daemons or, or control node. Um, then the ne next one is GitLab CI CD. So again, you define everything in YAML. It's very flexible. You can build uh, software packages, containers, and then in the end also deploy to Kubernetes. And finally, we also decided to use Customize. Um, yeah, so when you start deploying things on Kubernetes, you very likely will actually start with Helm because a lot of software is packaged with, with Helm. It's actually easy to deploy. Uh, but there are also like online heated discussions, uh, you know, which is better, Helm or, or Customize. Um, and those two tools are actually quite different. So one, one is imperative, supports templating, uh, but the other one is, is, is declarative. But actually, so Customize is also built in, in Cube Control, works with plain YAMLs, it's very minimal, and you, you know, work with overlays and patches. So we, we quickly realized that you know, Helm was not flexible enough for us, so we, we decided to go with, with, with Customize because we needed to you know, customize more things that uh, you normally have available in, in that values.yaml. So how we do it? Um, so we, we have a separate repo for all the manifests. Um, and we try to get like official manifests. If those are not available, we render Helm chart, so using help template, and, and everything goes into, into this repo. Um, then on top of this, we have custom overlays uh, to do you know, changes we need. And then in the end, we simply use GitLab CI CD to, to deploy, right? So kubectl apply minus k, and, and, and things are, are deployed on uh, our clusters. Um, also, a lot of software comes with operators, so you if you have this option, go for that. It's going to make your, uh, your operations easier. And what we also do, we, we have a custom operator to handle dynamic changes. So, for example, if there are new users and so on, uh, actually an operator kicks in and takes care of some changes there. And for this, we actually just went with a uh, shell operator because uh, it's really easy to implement stuff in it. OK, so the next big thing for us was storage. Um, so storage, as, as you know, uh, was initially you know, not uh, really well supported in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes was not developed for, for stateful workloads. Um, but yeah, nowadays, it is supported, um, and you will need you know, persistent storage. And there are two big types, right? So you have block storage and uh, obje object storage. And first, we, we, we had to kind of wrap around our, our heads about uh, how all this works. Right? And just to give you a, a quick uh, rundown, so you have persistent volume claims, you have persistent uh, volumes, and you have storage classes. And persistent volume claims, so, so those, those are claims, so that's uh, requested by, by, by pods. Uh, they're namespaced, and based on that claim, there, there is a persistent volume, which is created either manually or, or dynamically, and, and that's a cluster resource, and that's then mounted in, into a pod. But behind the scenes, you actually have storage classes, which depend on storage engine uh, or provisioner, and storage classes actually define how your application and access mode works. So for our uh, block storage, we decided to go with OpenEBS ecosystem. So we are using OpenEBS Hostpad and MyStore. So MyStore is for high availability deployments because we also do like single node deployments if needed. Um, MyStore provides application but needs minimum three nodes, and it's quite picky when it comes to hardware performance. Um, yeah, and this is how our storage classes look like, right? So we, we have two MyStore storage classes and one open EBS host path. And final storage component uh, is MinIO. 
So this is the one that provides uh, S3 uh, compatible storage for us. We went with it simply because it was already included with Kubeflow, but we did update it to, to a later version. But newer versions are under AGPL license, so that might be a problem for some organizations, but, but for us uh, it is fine and works well. And with this, uh, I hand off to Christian. Thank you. So let's talk a bit about um, how do we actually get users into the applications we host on Kubernetes. And here we use Istio. Um, we didn't actually choose that by ourselves, really, if we're honest, but that's also shipped via Kubeflow. Um, small team, we can't do everything ourselves, don't, um, can't then also rip that out of Kubeflow, so we decided to go with Istio um, as a service mesh. You can see some examples, um, so we use that for routing also, um, so that, for example, slash uh, min.io gets you to the web interface of Min.io, uh, we also use it then for authentication, which is also very nice. So if you don't know that, then if you are not logged in as a user, that will automatically um, redirect you to our um, identification provider, which we'll come to in a second. Um, but this doesn't really help us yet. How do we actually get users into our cluster? Because as you can see, at the moment, still is everything just running into the cluster. Um, originally, we first looked at something called Metal LB, but um, that seemed to be, at least for now, a bit too complex for our small team. So we did something like um, very simple. We just use Nginx um, as a proxy and have our users um, access Nginx. This obviously um, isn't very resilient um, because if that one host machine goes down, everything is down, our users can't access that anymore. So what we're really doing at the moment is um, something more like this. We have several host machines, all with an Nginx proxy on top of it. Um, and then um, we do two different approaches depending on the deployment. So either we actually just give users really three different URLs. So in case something goes down, which doesn't happen very often, our users are at the moment uh, technical enough so that they can just select something else. Obviously, this won't go uh, for the long run. When we really run models in production, this won't be a solution. Um, then we might have to look into uh, something like Metal LB again. But for the moment, uh, this, especially together with DNS failover, um, works pretty great. And we don't need that on every single um, node. Sometimes we uh, have like then bigger deployments or add some more nodes, which then don't come with Nginx on that. While we're at the topic of uh, networking, let's quickly talk about TLS. We can't go too much into detail here, but as probably all of you know, that's important and also important to get right. But on the other hand, it's also hard. And so some people um, might be just tempted to say, effort, we trust our users, um, let's disable that. We would say, don't do that. And if you've been to any of the security talks here, um, that opinion will probably be, have been confirmed there. So, what do you do instead? You need to learn about TLS. Unfortunately, there really is no way um, around that. But then, if you dive into it, it's really not that hard after all. Some topics you might want to pay special attention to is A, how does certificate signing work? And then also, how do you distribute those signed certificates to your hosts? We use Ansible for that as well. Um, and to distribute that, needed at different um, uh, places, so like on GitLab, but also then on our uh, Kubernetes nodes. And then you need to think about how do you get your certificate signed or by whom. So you can do that uh, self-signed, which we just use for our development classes, which we spin up, um, well, daily, if not hourly. But then we also like, uh, use Let's Encrypt, for example, or have those uh, certificates signed by um, the root certificate of the organization we are currently deploying to, so which could be Airbus or one of the universities. Um, unfortunately, this is about the time we have to go into uh, TLS, but um, as I said, important topic. What um, we also already somewhat mentioned is authentication. Here again, we use DEX because DEX comes with Kubeflow, 
And, um, well, we, I've seen some people on the internet who actually managed to rip out DAX out of Kubeflow and use Keycloak instead, which we would have liked to do as well because Keycloak, um, there's just a lot more information available online, like more documentation, there are more, um, well, it's easier to connect it to something else. Um, so we would have liked to use Keycloak because then we can also like connect it to Grafana, for example, or whatever other applications we're using. And then on the other end, for example, um, use Azure AD or GitHub as an authentication provider or whatever. But luckily, that can really just be connected pretty easily so that Kubeflow itself keeps continuing using DEX, but DEX then talks to Keycloak and then you can um, that way hook into whatever authentication provider you want to do. Um, that works then pretty well out of the box. Um, a note on Keycloak, at least the version we are currently using is not really um, Kubernetes native yet. So configuration is done via um, JSONs, which is pretty ugly. So currently what we are doing is we are configuring it um, with the web interface, exporting those JSONs and then loading them back into Keycloak. There are new versions available that use an operator and also then custom resources and custom resource definitions. We haven't tried that yet, but it looks a lot easier to handle um, in the near future. Then let's talk quickly about um, how do you find out what's going on in your cluster. Um, especially so I've been to that exhibition hall down there and like every second booth seems to offer some observability options. Uh, we are currently not using something as fancy as that. So we went for Prometheus and Grafana also just because it's like a very easy, um, lots of documentation available, lots of people use it. Uh, resources available for almost everything. So, um, for example, for KSurf, we would use for model serving, it's well integrated. Um, you get like pre configured monitors and dashboards for almost everything you can uh, think of. So, that is really very nice, and we are pretty happy with that. Um, we currently use uh, this Cube uh, Prometheus project to also monitor our cluster itself because. Also, we live on premises, and so we don't get that by our um, suppliers. And that is also very nice because it also comes more or less pre-configured. You just need to make sure to use the right version that um, fits to your Kubernetes version. Um, so we can highly recommend that as well. It also supports that metrics API that some software needs, for example, Kubeflow. Um, so full featured solution, very happy with that. We use a second instance of Prometheus to do application monitoring just because we did uh, try to mess as little as possible with that Prometheus instance by Kube Prometheus and then we also separately installed Grafana mostly because we wanted a newer version of Grafana so later version of Grafana come with something um, like a um, some query builder so we if, like me, you don't know really the, um, the query language that Grafana uses, you also have pretty easy access to get whatever you want. So um, for us, that looks like that. Also then, uh, logging. Logging is also very important, um, perhaps even more than monitoring. We use something else from Grafana there, Loki, also very happy with that. And the users here are not only cluster admins, but also the end users. Um, I'll quickly give you an example for that. So in Kubeflow, if you start a job, for example, um, it's also a pod. And if that pod then gets cleaned up after some time, your logs are gone. But perhaps you just check after uh, on a Monday morning what happened to my job. Job failed. You would like to see the logs um, not there anymore in the Kubeflow user interface by default. But then we, you can very quickly find it in Loki. We here use also. Um, like a bigger set like um, PLG, which is short for Promtail, Loki, Grafana, but also we don't use that Grafana there just because we want one unified interface. So that looks then in total like this for us. And um, if you've been at the talk before, so we also use um, Postgres, actually the same operator that uh, Kevin talked about before. Um, but also there, we don't use that Grafana that comes with that, but use uh, just one Grafana instance to just get all the data we um, want in that instance. So um, one big component we haven't talked at all here is really Kubeflow, and we're not going to go into detail here. Obviously, we really like Kubeflow. Otherwise, we hadn't uh, decided to use it as like the main um, 
machine learning ops component of our platform. And our users also really like Kubeflow, especially like the pipelines I just mentioned. Um, perhaps after an, a bit of an initial hesitation because it's a bit more complicated than just using a Jupyter notebook. Um, now they really um, start seeing the value in that and are excited about that. But what's also very good about Kubeflow is that it's very flexible. So if it doesn't exactly fit to your use case, you can very quickly um, make it fit to your use case. But on the other hand, that flexibility might also mean that the defaults are not exactly where you need them to be. And so that means um, Kubeflow can be modified rather easily, but perhaps also should be modified to actually um, get that out of what you actually want. Um, some examples, so limits, for example, for users are not there. Um, like on one of our very first deployments, like a data scientist um, found like a, a feature in those pipelines to start uh, concurrent pods, did like 1,000 pods at the same time, worked fine, tried 10,000 pods, and it turns out like uh, Eceteridi didn't like that too much, and that brought the whole cluster down. So um, since then, we set some users, not done by hand, but the, by that operator that we wrote that Samu mentioned earlier. Um, then there are quite a lot of default containers there, but they also might not be exactly what you're looking for. But also there, it's pretty straightforward um, to get like your own default containers, which you can then also expose to your users that they can uh, get like something that's a default perhaps for your organization. Stuff like um, access to those Kubeflow pipelines isn't also there by default, like pod defaults, but we also supply that and would recommend you do that as well. In general, the documentation around Kubeflow perhaps isn't the best. Um, we probably could contribute more and we just started with that. But what is very nice is like the community, there's a Slack channel um, and people are really very, very helpful. So if you um, have any problems, um, reach out there. I can only recommend that as well. We are coming to more or less the end of the presentation. And before we um, go, we would like to leave you with some tips and tricks. So as you can see, we had quite a bit of fun uh, with Midjourney there. So all those um, like pictures are generated by that. Uh, some ideas on debugging. So we also use cube control locks and exec a lot. Um, but then also we like uh, K9S and Lens very much to have a look at what's currently going on in your cluster. Then we can highly recommend a YAML validator for your IDE. So at least Sam and I are both using um, something from Red Hat. It's called, I think, YAML language server, which is part of that LSP ecosystem, which means like more or less no matter what editor you're using, you can uh, use that to get your YAMLs validated on the spot. Then we really like JQ, YQ to pre-process some YAMLs, perhaps even before we uh, do deployments. So um, make something fit the environment variables we set and so on. Um, so then, reminder, check your hardware requirements. So especially Maya Store really wants uh, like low latencies, for example. Version requirements might also need to be checked. Um, something that we didn't do from the start, so micro k 8 for example, doesn't come with RBAC enabled from the start, but you need to manually enable that. We started without that and then um, enabled that later that led to some issues which would have been like much easier to fix I guess when we um, had that from the start. We already mentioned shell operator but also a um, tool we would like to recommend is BATS, the Bash automated testing system which we use to test the whole platform in itself. Finally like one of my um, like least favorite bugs we run into is that if you have huge pages enabled on your host machine, which we needed to where we run a Maya store, then Postgres might have some issues if you don't explicitly give it um, huge pages like you can see on the right. So if you have issues like that, um, have a look. At least we didn't find the error messages there too helpful. And I think it's a bit of a discussion whose fault it is, if that's Postgres or the Linux kernel's fault, um, but it seems to get fixed. So this brings us to more or less the end of our presentation. Let me quickly summarize. We showed you how we built an MLOps platform, what 
um, what components we choose. Not all of them, obviously. So um, there's like lots of topics we didn't uh, touch at all, like secrets management, um, like how do we do upgrading and stuff like that. But not everything is possible, like in uh, 30 minutes we have. Um, some key takeaways. We already mentioned the first one. Automate as much as possible, especially if you're in a small team. Like one day invested now might save you like a week or more later. So um, we would say definitely to do that. Then don't be afraid asking for help on Slack channels and so on. But then obviously also don't forget to give back later um, if you found out something or if you can help somebody else. And then, so for me, I always liked a lot to just experiment with stuff. But like if you dive into something, at least for me, new, like Kubernetes, which is really such a big ecosystem, it also makes sense to pick up a book or something and learn a bit about the basics. To conclude, um, building something like this with a very small team, um, especially on premise, is hard and can't be done in four weeks. Um, it took us something like six months, I guess, before um, people were really productively using that. And we haven't figured it out completely yet. We are still like iterating, improving, and so on. And I think we will also um, be doing that for quite some while. But the good news is, uh, if you really commit to it, it totally can be done, even with a really small team. Before we come to the questions, I would like to remind you um, that this was a group effort. Even though it was only Samu and me talking, um, lots of more people involved. Some are also here, I've already spotted. So if you want to come afterwards and chat about other topics or any of that what we just mentioned, uh, come by, they'll probably also like uh, hang out. Also, some of those people really know a lot about space. So if you were here for the space part and were really like uh, disappointed that we didn't go into that, um, we can also make that happen afterwards. Thank you for your time. And please don't forget to rate this talk. Thank you.